So this is the schedule. Today I will talk about uh, smart shipyard, and also uh, I need to finish, finish up uh, slide which one is not covered on Tuesday. About that is related with this one: production automation and robotics. And then we choose which one to cover: Kyard or Industry 4.0 because we don't may have uh, enough time. And then next week, there will be no class. We will have the final presentation of project on two weeks time, 22nd, right? Any, any question on schedule? No? And I may show you this one. Uh, production automation and robotics in Shimyard. This slide is originally uh, prepared by a person who was working in Samsung heavy industry a long time. Now he is in inside Kaist, another division. So he had been uh, 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 invited to lecture some time ago. So I use his slide set for the, today. And I also modify a little bit to update some things and, and also include some video clips. Right, the offshore and shipbuilding industry. Uh, this one shows that the uh, exploration should be started using a drilling to see whether there is a economical size of a uh, reservoir of oil or gas. Once they found a good size of reservoir that contains a nice, good quality of oil or gas, then they start to produce. So exploration and drilling can be together and production can be another step. So it, it is later stage. Also, they use different uh, devices for drilling and also for the production. And then after production, you need to transport to the land side to, to be used. Right? And drill ships, and for the drilling or semi-league type or jackup type, but anyway, they need to have a drill bit to make a hole inside the, under the seabed of the ocean. And for the production, FPSO is uh, famous nowadays, but there can be different type style of production platform, such as TLP, TLP is a tension leg platform, and other semi li semi submersible and Jacob type also can be used. Okay. Oh, at the bottom there is a full name of FPSO, floating production storage and offloading. TLP is for tension leg. For the transportation, if it is a gas, then we need to have an LNG carrier. Or if it is oil, then you need to have a VLCC. VLCC is a very large crude oil carrier. Or sometimes if the reservoir is located in a very cold region, such as Arctic, North Pole or South Pole near, nearby, then we need to have a special kind of ship called the Arctic shuttle ships. And Offshore industry or ocean plant can be separated as uh, drilling platforms and production platforms. For the transportation, it is categorized as a ship building because they are ship and they have been around for more than uh, thousand years. But ocean plant was new, new uh, 
devices or for mankind. So official industry and shipbuilding industry, you can divide into this way. And the structure, the size, I already mentioned it before, but here is a nice picture of Lotte World Tower in Seoul. Probably this is the tallest building in Korea now, South Korea. And the height is 500 and more meters. And there is a other big buildings in, in Seoul. There is a Yuksan building that has been uh, the number one building for a long time until the Lotte World Tower is built. And then the other countries has uh, Petronas is in Malaysia, Taipei, and Burj Khalifa is in UAE or somewhere in Middle East. And that is probably the tallest one at this moment. In size 800 more. Now the ships, the 16,000 TU container ship is about 400 meter. This is uh, very similar to the size of the ship Ever Given, which was uh, locked inside the Suez Canal uh, months ago. And the other one, right hand side, is Shell LNG FPSO. So it's a F FPSO, floating production storage and operating. But it is for LNG gas. And the company is Shell. So Shell's LNG FPSO. And the size is about 500 meters. So you may see that the ship is very big comparing to the landmark buildings or oh, oh, it's bigger than Petronas. All right, so bulk carrier, as I told you before, that it uh, has a large hatch cover. And through this hatch cover hole under the cover, you need to have a large opening to pour and grab and bulk grains such as core or ore or real grains. And shipbuilding uh, is something like a block building. Block means uh, the one piece here, the crane is lifting. We call this a ship block or super block sometimes. So that the shipbuilding process can be uh, combining combining uh, large blocks into one piece. So it's very complicated work, but if it is success, then the productivity or completing time can be very short. And is that something like uh, Lego blocks? Right. Uh, the, these blocks are uh, manufactured outside of the shipbuilding company nowadays. Outsourcing is coming also here. So that uh, pieces or blocks are manufactured inside Korea, but different region area, or it can be uh, manufactured inside China. And then they bring these blocks to the shipbuilding company and then they join them and finish up. That is the way. So building block or unit block or P block, uh, pre-erection, the P is a pre-erection block. And then erection is here, E pre-erection and then launching. So erection and, and joining, you need, you need to have a building between blocks and then the ship can be float. So this is the overall process of a ship pro production. Uh, at the beginning, you need to import the steel plate. And then second one is priming. Priming is a painting for not to be in rust case because the steel plate can be rust because of the oxygen. 
so that uh, to prevent any rust, metal rust, then you need to have a primer painting. And then so the uh, process is a cutting, cutting of plate into to make uh, blocks. And the fourth step is subassembly. And so assembly is a smaller size assembly. First stage and then assembly is more medium size assembly. And finally, we need to have a grand assembly. So it, it can build into a block, complete block. And then there can be a, a each block need to have an outfitting process. Outfitting means something like a piping, cabling, and other uh, materials uh, attached to the steel plate. And then another painting. Now he is a painting rather than priming. And painting is a real color, which will, will be shown onto completed ship. Painting processes also takes uh, time and also it's not easy because of the chemical. Okay. And then pre-election, pre-election in old days, this job is in, uh, done inside the uh, dry dock. In where you see that erection process, the ship is uh, built inside the dry dock, a, a large uh, uh, swimming pool like this. For this, uh, we call this is dry dock. But pre erection is trying to make uh, mega blocks uh, outside of uh, dry dock. Why? Because we need to have uh, more productivity to have uh, shipbuilding more faster. So pre erection is combining blocks into mega blocks. And then the mega block is brought into the dry dock, a swimming pool. And when they are joined together, then can be looks like a ship. So the dry, dry dock is uh, filled with uh, water so that the ship is floating and can be carried outside of the dry dock. And at the outfitting uh, key, uh, the ship uh, staying there and finish up uh, their outfitting uh, remaining works, something like uh, uh, electronic uh, cabling and, and other small jobs, but it takes time. And then the finish, the ship is finished. Then they need to have a test whether the performance is coming. So we call this a C trial. This is very important because the contract performance should be shown at the C trial. And once it is passed that uh, test, then we can have a ceremony for the handover or delivery of the ship. So that is the whole process of shipbuilding. Do you have any question? No. So, and up to here, the work is usually done inside the plant. So under the uh, roof housing, and the other half is done outside of uh, the building. So it can be outdoor work. So for the outdoor, the weather is important, right? It can be a raining, it can be a snow, it can be dark, or it can be windy. So it is dependent on uh, weather status. But inside the indoor work can be done anytime, right? full, full time, anytime yeah, around the club. So, uh, oh, there is a video about the uh, big crane, floating crane, uh, okay. mega floating crane in the world, uh, South Korea. Uh, let's see this video. The link is not working. Let me see. I just we can find out. Uh, mega floating crane. Uh, 
Okay, let's see this one, probably this one. show it to you. The mega protein crane HHI probably. Three thousand, but we need to have a uh, right this one can be but I don't know whether this is in English. Probably this one, but I, I don't know whether this is in English, but let's see this. This crane has 180m급 롱붐 two gears and two sets of 70m 규모의 백스테이와 크레인 작동을 위한 윈치는 메인 호이스팅 윈치 16개와 집 호이스팅 윈치 8개가 있으며 와이어 로프는 각각 직경이 72mm와 54mm급으로 총 길이 5,700m로 구성되어 있습니다. 크레인의 메인 후크는 1,250톤급 8세트로 구성되고 안전하게 들어올릴 수 있는 중량물의 무게는 만 톤까지입니다. HD 만 톤급 해상 크레인은 해안에서 중량물을 리프팅뿐만 아니라 해상에서 고정식 플랫폼과 기타 다른 중량물 리프팅을 수행할 수 있는 뛰어난 능력을 가지고 있습니다. 또한 재난재해로부터 발생된 좌초선 인양 작업 그리고 울산 대교와 같은 현수교와 광안 대교와 같은 사장교 등 대교 건설 작업, 초대형 해상 풍력 발전기 설치에도 활용이 가능한 육해상 전천후 작업 크레인입니다. HD 만톤급 해상 크레인은 FLNG 등 해상 구조물 탑재와 암벽 작업을 통한 대형 구조물 탑재 해결책을 제공할 것입니다. This is the large. Oh, this is another block.
Okay. That is the, I guess, the biggest crane in, in Korea, probably. There are more internationally. But you see that that is used for ship construction or ocean plant construction. All right. So block is divided into many pieces. Right. It looks like uh, small blocks about size of 20 meter, but still big, okay? 20 meter is big. 20 meter can be four or five uh, floors building. Okay? But you see from this uh, picture, where is it? I know. Right. Currently, the mega blocks are built like this one. So the uh, whole ship with cut into several pieces now uh, can be handled in nowadays. So we call this is a mega block, and this is a old type of uh, small size or typical blocks of say one thousand tone each, the weight can be. Then you need to have a, say, how many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And three of them and 20, and then more, say 25 or 30 blocks should be welded together to complete a ship. So it takes a long hour to handling and welding. But if you put, this one cut into say five big pieces, then it can be very short to complete the whole ship. But anyway, this one is a process of uh, starting from a uh, steel plate and then cutting and then joining by attaching uh, frames to make more stronger, uh, very similar to our ribs of chest, chest ribs or fishy uh, bones. The steel plate is still uh, not enough to strong. So we need to put some frames uh, like this one, the cross frames and, and other stuff. And then this can be a unit block small size assembly, then it is com combined into a section into a ship. So the process is the final uh, in reverse way, this unit block is attached to as a portion of the ship. And the unit block is coming from these two pieces together. And each piece is made by the smaller uh, assembly of pieces. And finally, the original is coming from the steel plate, coming from the steel maker. Okay. So this is the way they are making this, the cutting, bending and welding is the main process of uh, steel structures. So cutting and forming and welding. Okay. And panel, sub-assembly and panel. Okay. And assembly, they call it, and then grand assembly, and then pre lift That is the way they are talking about. And block painting, this is a new idea. So that the painting, spray painting is very uh, dirty work and very difficult because of the chemicals coming, because we are sp spraying a chemical, very strong chemical. And also the uh, all side, in, in, this one is inside the ship. The whole interior should be sprayed, painted. So inside the room is also very bad condition for the human. So now they use uh, this kind of a robot, but it is a, a hanging robot. So by co uh, controlling the length of the, how many of them? Four, four cables. 
attached to the box, they can make a positioning of the spray, spray block. So the grit blasting and recovery and spraying and drying, this is the process of block painting. And simulation can be done. And then this is a typical uh, division of uh, man hours of the Hidachi Jozen, not Korean shipbuilding in Japan. And the man hour is divided about 25% is for welding. About the total length is 800 kilometer for VLCC. VLCC is a very large crude oil carrier. Also about 25% is for the uh, painting. And they paint uh, 45, uh, no, 450,000 liter of paint. And then fitting, fitting, fitting can be also welding kind of, piping and electric, electric uh, outfitting, machinery and scaffolding others. So that you can see that welding and painting is very big process inside the shipping company. Oh, there is one video about welding robot. See this? Like any commercial vessel, will be at the mercy of the elements. So it's vital that her hull is as strong as possible. For her build team, this means making sure that every single joint is flawless. When you weld block joints like this, it, it looks something like this here. Yeah? When you're finished, it will look something like this. This is the weld. To join the hull, the team must complete the mammoth three and a half miles of welding. So to speed things up, they're using a special welding robot. For setting it up, you put a rail with magnets on the ship side with a small tooth uh, rail, and then the welding machine can travel upwards by itself. This machine melts welding wire into the gap between two sheets of steel, creating a rock-solid join. That's pretty smart. Once underway, the robot can complete a weld in less than half the time of a human. It does reduce the amount of time they weld on these flat vertical surfaces. Next, the pressure is on for the tanker's paint team. It looks fine. Yeah. Apart from the smoke and the smell, it's fine. But that's normal by welding. It's a good job. Job well done. Right. And then, oh, there is another what? Uh, welding video, uh, different kind, indoor, indoor welding, probably. Let's see this.
is the two videos on welding robots. And here looks like a LNG tank. Uh, it's called, this is a Mark three type LNG tank. And size you see 40 meter wide and 40 meter height. This looks like a eight or nine floor building of a height and length too. Right? There is a cubic, looks like a cubic, putted cubic. And there are 10 planes because it is cutted. And we need to have a plasma welding of hundreds of uh, membranes. Because this uh, LNG tank has a very a thin uh, uh, stainless steel, so the welding is very tough work. And so they to have a, a robot building uh, of a spider type robot. Then this is, looks like a real picture, including human body. So Mark three type uh, LNG tank of size of 40 meter each. So it's very big. Right? So inside this uh, LNG is filled and carried. You see that uh, it is liquefied LNG. So it's a fluid. And also the temperature is about minus 200 Celsius. So it's a very tough condition there. All right, that's it. Question or comment? No question? All right, then we can have a five minute break. And I'll come back on 1.40, right? Two uh, remaining slide set. But I guess I cannot cover all of them, most of them. So I hope I want to know which one you want to see first. Uh, you can uh, write down your chatting or, or in sound. Two choices. One is about Industry 4.0, and the other one is KYAD project. So which one do you want to see first? Please let me know. All right. Okay. Uh, industry 4.0 is two, two selection. Okay. All right. So we have uh, five students and there is no other response yet. So I will start with the uh, industry 4.0 first. And if you have a time, then I can cover key yet. Right. So this is a typical uh, presentation I use for in this, what is industry 4.0. Okay. And there are four phases of industrialization. And one, number one was in end of 18th century. And they use uh, mechanical power. They are saying water power or steam power. So mechanical production facility. They started a factory using this power. And second industry was in beginning of 20th century. They use uh, electrical power. And then also sharing uh, work sharing of mass production. So uh, it, there are more slides on this, but uh, Ford company, Ford Motors, develop a concept of a conveyor belt to start the uh, mass production of cars at the time. But uh, behind that story, there is uh, electrical power is used. 
Uh, in the C3.0, uh, it is about early 1970s when the computer is started at the time, computer is developed. So electronics and IT it is used to automate uh, production works. And now we are talking about industry 4.0 today. And they are saying cyber physical system and also analyze and automate uh, business. Yeah. We'll see more on this. Same story in different picture. Uh, they have a more a clear ear of in the 1.0 mechanical weaving room. Weaving is to texture cotton and water and steam power in 1784 and probably around England. In the 2.0 is first production line, mass production using electrical energy in 1870 in Michigan State of the United States. And 1969 is uh, industry 3.0 first programmable logic controller, PLC, and electronics and IT for, for the automation. So it's also inside the United States. Industry 4.0 based on cyber physical system, linking uh, real object with the information processing virtual object and processes by uh, information network and, and uh, internet. But my uh, understanding is saying that uh, smartphone is the another uh, big input to this industry 4.0. So we are all of, many of them are, of us are talking about smart factory, smart manufacturing and smart something. So smartphone brings us, yeah, the internet and also telecommunication is behind that smartphone. All right, so at the beginning, before the industry 1.0, there was a agricultural revolution and technical and chemical and also cattle, uh, biological. So technically the planter, harvester and thresher are used. In the right hand side, you see that uh, uh, technologies, uh, devices, First one is a Sembra manual. It is for uh, planting. And second one is a mechanical uh, planting device. And third one is also kind of mechanical device for, oh, this is a enlarged picture of a second picture. So the sectional view of the second picture. So, at the top, we use a manual hand to planting, plant uh, uh, seed. But in the second picture and third picture, we use people, uh, human, uh, trying to use a device to speed up uh, the agricultural planting. And fertilizer also is good. And also the cattle. And by, by using uh, breeding cattle, the meat consumption is increased. That helps uh, human more healthy and stronger. And steam power is used at the bottom picture. So what did the agricultural revolution result in? Uh, we start from a uh, food surplus. So the doubling of food production and it helps a uh, uh, good uh, eating food supply and then we had a uh, human kind have a better health stronger and also uh, lower the death rate including the development in medical technology and then it helps us to increase the population right so the surplus of population gathered, collected as uh, cities. 
rather than in the farm field. That is the beginning of uh, industrial revolution because there are many people, they start to make uh, cottons and clothes using steam powers, mechanical powers. Right, so cause of industrial revolution is saying that surplus of population helps to make a revolution. There was a population boom in the early 1800, uh, because of the agricultural uh, efficiency, there are more food, and also because of technology, we need uh, less workers for the farming. So extra workers turn to cottage industry, like a weaving factory. That gives us a rise of factories. Oh, industry 1.0. And this one is a book about uh, being digital, written by Nicolas Nigroponte of Media Lab of MIT around uh, 20 years ago. And he's saying, food or car, which one is more important or critical? If there is no food, we can be die, right? But without car, we still can stay. So uh, car is not indispensable, but, but the price of car is much higher than food. Right? So price and independence uh, critical is different point. Once again, if we com compare with the car and uh, painting by Picasso, which one is more expensive? because our painting is much, much more expensive. But which one is indispensable? Without Picasso painting, we can be, there can be no problem, right? But without car, it, it can be very in, inconvenience. Right? So food, car, and painting is in, in progressively more and more price, higher price, but Criticality is more on baseline of food. So surplus, surplus induces changes in society. Supply, surplus of food, uh, create uh, cities and factories. Now there are surplus of uh, cars around us. So we can choose car when we buying a car. Right? There are more companies they produce cars. So supported by technology in agriculture and factories, uh, resources are more well used and, and produced. So now the food garbage inside Korea, South Korea, uh, uh, discharged daily. Many people are saying we can feed those uh, food, remaining food to feed many, many starving children around the world, including, I don't know whether there is, but North Korea. Right? So food surplus is here, but still there are starving people too. But altogether, uh, there are surplus. Right? But there is difference between digital and physical. Right? So food, if we are shared between people, my portion can be smaller. Right? But the good information, or digital information, something like a good wording, like inside contents, like uh, music or film, it can be shared but there is no shortage. It can be multiplied by 100, but still the content is the same. So there is a difference between physical uh, things and, and digital things. But one small side effect is price fluctuation of stock market or Picasso painting. 
is much bigger. The fluctuation rate and size is bigger than the elementary food or cars. They are, the fluctuation is more stable there. So there is the one differences between uh, things, digital being. This one is all about the same uh, categorization of industrial revolution. So I will not explain this almost same contents with different picture. And also this one too, right? It is, I copied this one from Wikipedia. But at the first uh, revolution, bottom side, I wrote that there is a big data and artificial intelligence is important. But still, we are figuring out what is the first revolution, industrial revolution. We still don't know yet. So I will try to show you what is the outsourcing. Outsourcing is coming uh, more and more. So in the Ford company, in 100 years ago, they have a very famous car called uh, named of T1. T1 is the name of the car when the Ford developed being their mass production using conveyor belt. And there was a Rouge factory at the time and still there. The name of the factory of Ford company, Ford Motors company was Rouge. And this is biggest uh, factory in the world at the time. Probably now still, but now the size of factory is much smaller now. But at that time, hundred thousand people worked at one one factory at near uh, Detroit or Michigan, and the factory has a uh, steel mill inside the. Uh, factory and also glass factory inside. So they, the factory make all the uh, parts of the car at one place. So there is no outsourcing. Okay. They, the plant, Ruji plant, plant has a shipping port. So ship, are coming to the factory to transport uh, ore, ore is for the uh, resource for steel making, and also the sand for the glass making. So they import raw material to convert to make every part of the car at one site. So it is a very big plant. Nowadays, the Ruji factory is still there. Well, most of them are used as a Ford museum now. But at the corner of that factory, there is a, a assembly line of Ford pickup truck. But they, the uh, modules or parts of the car or pickup truck is uh, delivered from the outside of the factory. So that at there, they have only final assembly. Very similar to the block, shipbuilding block is outsourced from the China in Korean Shinyard. They just finish up uh, assembling of the ship. That is similar story nowadays. And also about the mass production, nowadays uh, we call this is mass customization rather than mass production. You see what is the difference. So this is a picture from uh, 100 years ago for, for the Ruji plant. Picture is coming from the Ford Museum. And probably this one looks like a steel mill where they make a steel plate inside the factory. Okay. And this also shows a assembly line 100 years ago. Left hand side, a fold assembly line, conveyor belt. But you see that there are many uh, people inside along the conveyor belt, and also the size of the parts. Each part is very small. Right? But right hand side, you see that there's a Hyundai Motors assembly, the final assembly line, 
and there is no conveyor belt, but the flow of the car is very similar. Instead of a conveyor, they use a lift. But here they use a very bigger size of modules attached to the car so that assembly process is much simpler, quicker and simpler because they use a bigger, bigger parts or, or module. Very similar to shipbuilding. Shipbuilding nowadays, they use only seven uh, super uh, mega blocks using uh, big floating cranes. All right, so oversupply or surplus, surplus, uh, surplus, let me show you. So plus. Right. Uh, so the surplus of uh, agricultural food and surplus of car is already here, but I'm talking about surplus of data or information over the internet. And nowadays it is doubles, the whole data size is doubles every hundred years. So in one year, there are 350 days. You see that the data size over the world is eight times higher, much bigger than one year before. So surplus of food is uh, nowadays surplus of cars and what can be helping to surplus of uh, information or data or culture. So anyway, in, in old days, surplus induces uh, change inside society. So what will be the next uh, change of society because of uh, the surplus of information or data? We may see, think about this one. This one is picture coming from 50 years ago inside Korea or 70 years ago when there was a Korean war. So because of the war, the resources, including food, nowadays this looks like water, right? But anyway, it was very rare. So many people are starving at that time. So we need to have a... a share a small amount of resources or food or what. And I'm trying to show you this one as uh, who has the power? The market is driven by suppliers in, at the time. Right? They call this a supplier market. But nowadays, if there are more surplus of supply, more food, more than enough food, more than enough cars are produced by factories, companies, then we can see that it is the power is uh, moved to the buyers or customers. So we call this is a buyer's market rather than supplier's market. So 100 years ago, the Ford company at the time, there are so large uh, need for car uh, purchasing. So it, at the time it was a supplier market because it is easy to sell if you have a good car. Right? That's why the Ford uh, developed a mass production system. But nowadays uh, car is more than enough produced. So that customer is king nowadays. So this is a changed situation there. So that's why we need to have a personalized production. Over capacity, over supply, that brings you the supply market to buyer market, buyer's market nowadays. So in hundred years ago, Ford company was a king, a strong power as a supplier. But in, in nowadays, because of the overcapacity, oversupply, customer is the king. Right? So it's a buyer's market. Customer is king, right? So 
mass customization, every, everybody has, everyone, every people, every human has his own interest, own taste. So producers or sellers need to meet the requirement coming from each customer. That is the reason behind the mass customization or even to the personalization. To meet this uh, situation, the suppliers uh, depending on more on AI and deep learning technology to not to lose their market. Okay, this one is uh, copied from the book called uh, Global Manufacturing Re Revolution written by Koren. Koren is a professor of University of Michigan in the United States. So paradigm, paradigm change from starting from 1850 at the bottom right, we know that there is a handcraft uh, manufacturing of custom tailor, tailor, custom tailor. And then about 1913, the photo developed a mass customization conveyor belt. So we can uh, around 1955 was a peak time of mass production. We use computers, we use uh, motors and mechanical powers, engines to produce many, many. Up to them, there is a supplier market then. But nowadays there is oversupply. In 1980, uh, overcapacity is much uh, worse than so that mass customization. Now it becomes back to the personalized production very similar to uh, 1850, when there is a handicrafted uh, manufacturing. But this is different situation, but the uh, market, market situation is similar. Or making personalized product. So paradigm transition over time, craft production, mass production, mass customization, and now we arrive at personalized production in near future. And in terms of uh, designing or manufacturer side or customer size, the role of customer is changed around the four paradigms. At the beginning, the craft production, customer is uh, requires specific item to the uh, maker, craftsman. So that there is a very big involvement between customer and seller, maker. But at the mass production system, it is divided. So because it is seller's market, so manufacturer expect uh, what can be the good product for customers. So they design, they make many, of the same product and then sell to the customer. So customer does not have many options to choose. Now it is changed to mass customization. Uh, customer has more power. So they are involved in uh, purchasing process. Now these options are more popular names so that we can choose among different options. So there are more variety of uh, uh, choice of product. And it is further go come to the personalized production, then probably customer may be involved in the design process. We we'll see this. Right. So speed factory of Adidas shows that in old days, human crafted uh, shoes, but nowadays they change their uh, uh, store where there is, uh, in the, this is a looks like old style uh, Adidas factory, but nowadays they are 3D printing of the uh, foot shore, the bottom of the shoe, and then the robots are sewing the shoes. And now the new uh, do, uh, shops are 
looks like a robot uh, working for the personalized shoe making. So this is the new trend in personalized production of shoes. Okay. Uh, to the uh, shipbuilding of hope, industry 4.0 for shipbuilding. The shipbuilding uh, industry is very uh, specific or special in that the price fluctuation is very high. See in the uh, left hand picture, this is a five year old bulk carrier price. Right? So second hand uh, bulk carrier, you can say. And uh, this the range of the years are starting from January 76 up to January 2000. So it is about 25 years. Right? During that uh, period, the price fluctuation is about 7.4 times. And right hand side is the oil tanker. So oil tanker has more fluctuation. During the same period of time, the price, price fluctuation is 14 times, not twice, 14 times of fluctuation. Highest and lowest uh, range is very big. Now, this one is for the car, automotive car. You see that at the bottom, the range is from January 95 to up to May 13. So it is about same period, about 20 or 18 years. But th this is also used to be price index of uh, association. And because of the March 2009, there was an economical crisis around the world. Lehman Brothers, remember? So that the price was very bad at the time. But anyway, the fluctuation is only 1.5 times, only 50% of price fluctuation in automotive industry. Comparing to the shipbuilding industry, there is a 14 times of a fluctuation of price. The ship price is 10 times higher or lower than before, right? So it's very big, big difference comparing to the automotive industry. So you need to know about this kind of situation in the shipbuilding industry. This one is coming from Japan. And you see that there is a world uh, fluctuation of production of the whole shipbuilding company around the world. At right hand side, uh, let's see the bottom side, it shows you year of 19, starting from 1973 up to 2015. So it's about how many years? 28 and so it's more than 40 years, right? 40 years of world shipbuilding industry. Right hand side, you see that at the bottom, blue color is Japan, Red color is China, yellow color is Korea, green color is Europe altogether. And then brown color is the remaining company, remaining countries. And at the right hand top, the market share in 2015 is China is 37, Korea is 34, Japan is 19 and Europe is 2%. And fluctuation, let's see. At the first in 1973, there was a first uh, oil shock. But because of the uh, war between Egypt and Israel in Mid Middle East, the oil price is uh, four times higher in, in one, on one week, within one week. That is created a, a economic crisis around the world. And 1978, there is a also second oil shock, also coming from the Middle East war. In 1980, there was a, that is inside Japan. Japan, they reduce 
uh, shipbuilding capacity because at that time, at the time, Japan was the world leading uh, country. Right? You see from the chart that the blue color in around 1973 and 76 is biggest. And also second one is uh, Europe. Right? Europe is uh, several countries together. Right? But you see that around, say, 1997, the uh, yellow color is becoming bigger or around the same as Japan. So that is Korea. So in between, in 1985, there was a plaza agreement so that uh, Japan has a big trouble because of the exchange rate. So that the bubble crisis was happening in, in, in Japan. So first uh, uh, capacity reduction in 1980 in Japan was because of the oil shock. But second one in 1988 is uh, second uh, capacity reduction is due to Praja agreement. So world shipbuilding, total shipbuilding record is lowest at that time, 1988. So every country, including China and Korea or Europe was too very bad. So that's why Japan also reduced their capacity. But after that, uh, the shipbuilding uh, capacity is very uh, rise rapidly until 2012, right? 2012. So during that time, uh, Korea was uh, expanded their capacity. And around 2003, you see that China also expanded their capacity. So nowadays, uh, Korea and China is the two big country who produce. Uh, well, see the history that 1997, there is a Asia financial crisis, including IMF crisis in Korea. But uh, you see that shipbuilding industry was good at, even at the time. Even in Korea, shipbuilding was good, even though whole Korea was not good. In 2008, there was also a Lehman shock. The uh, whole world was in, under economic crisis. But you see that shipbuilding industry was good, even though uh, financial crisis in around the world or coming from Lehman shock. So that is very interesting picture. All right, so let me show you this one and then I can finish. This is coming from EU, EU not, not all, all the world, but they are more counting on employment and economic size of the marine and maritime economic activities. They call this is a blue growth. Inside that, they count shipbuilding as a one portion. You see that there is a tourism, offshore, shipping and, and yachting and also to, uh, fishery, uh, inland waterway transportation all together about water related uh, uh, economic activities. So that is the way the EU countries are moving towards. Okay, it's time so we can finish up. Any question? No, then we can stop here and uh, see you uh, 20 seconds for the final presentation of your project. All right, bye now.